Today we're going to be going over some of the top reasons that we believe that bull pythons just stop eating for whatever reason. Everybody knows that a number one issue, the number one complaint to bull pythons, at least from a keeping standpoint, is that they're picky eaters or that they'll just go off food for some time. So let's dissect that, talk about the reasons, maybe some possible obstacles that you can maybe overcome here and why it's probably nine times out of 10, nothing that you should worry about at all. Our first reason today that we'll go into is a pretty easy one to fix and it's just because the prey size isn't right. And I'm not referring to the preference in prey, that's something we'll get into later. Perhaps you have put a rodent in that is way too big. The general rule of thumb that you wanna go by is to provide a rodent that is about as thick as the thickest part of your snake's body. You can go maybe a little bit bigger as they're growing, but that is generally where you want to be. You can also go a little smaller if you feel like they're a little intimidated often people will try to give their animals large meals to get them up to size a lot quicker and I totally understand the temptation to do this but it's actually gonna cause the snake to stop eating too big of a meal in general sometimes they feel satisfied they're good they don't want to eat the next week and that's if they ate it at all if they see something that is too large for them to take they're just not going to so make sure it's an appropriate size and counter to that if it's too small they might not even recognize it as prey if you try to give a pinky or a rat pup to a large snake, more often than not, they won't recognize it as food. They'll just let it sit there. So always make it an appropriate size one. This is a pretty easy one to fix in my opinion. Just eyeball it, make sure it's the same size. If your snake is that thick, well, don't offer a rodent that's any bigger than that really, especially if they're not eating. In fact, you can maybe go just a teensy bit smaller, but not too small because for one, you're not really feeding them anything besides a chicken nugget. And two, they are likely not going to recognize it as food. This could also turn into a sort of habit for them where they just naturally will start refusing food. And on that, our next topic would be that they are habit forming and experience driven animals. This this is a very important point. Things can snowball pretty fast. If your bull python refuses its meal, it is more likely that it is going to refuse its next meal. Now, what I'm saying is not that it's more than likely that it's gonna do that. Every single snake is its own individual again, and sometimes they will skip a week and go right back onto it the next week. But if you create a situation where you try to feed them and they don't eat, and then you try again the very next day and they don't eat, and then you try again, the the very next day. All you are doing is upsetting this animal and what you have now created is a situation where it is dreading this and it's stressed out and if it does strike, it's a defensive strike. It just wants the rodent to go into its corner and leave it alone. This is very habit forming. And again, they're very experience driven. And let me share a personal story with that. I have a banana black pastel head clown girl. I got her and she was a great eater. She, as far as I can remember, never skipped until one day I put a rodent in there. Before I could even close the tub, she had great grabbed it, but she didn't coil it. She grabbed it right on the mouth and the rodent went berserk. She very quickly released it and she did not eat for, I think, three to four months. She hasn't done that since. And she's back now to eating very regularly, which is great. But she would have already bred for me had she not gone on this crazy hunger strike. And sometimes that just happens. And it was from a bad experience. Sometimes you can't help it. How was I supposed to help that really? I mean, I suppose someone could say that I could have always fed frozen thawed, but snakes sometimes don't eat frozen thawed. But if you you can control it if there's maybe something loud in the room, another pet, a dog or a cat. They're not gonna like that while they're trying to eat. That is a predator to them. They're naturally not going to even really enjoy you looming over them. So try to make it a good experience every single week and realize that they are habit forming. So don't try to overfeed them and don't push it. If they don't eat two weeks in a row is what I'd say, then don't feed them the next week. Now what we're talking about here are some established animals, but even in hatchlings, you might get a new ball python you were very inclined as a human being to think that it needs the same health concerns that you do, but it doesn't. Even a hatchling can go quite some time without eating. Although in some cases they can be a little bit more cause for concern, but a full grown adult really can't think of very many instances where it is in a cause for concern. Maybe a cause for concern whether I can breed them next year, but not their health. I have had ones that didn't eat for nine months after laying their eggs. And during this time, I'm happy to report that they lost 10 grams of weight. That is it. So. Like I said, this is a very important topic. Just realizing how habit forming and experience driven they are. There's sometimes things that you're not gonna be able to do to help any of that, but there are some things that you can do to prevent some bad habits and bad experiences from happening. 
Next up would be a change of environment. Ball pythons are very attentive to their environment and they, they get very used to it. They like things a certain way. If you keep your ball python on cocoa husk and you decide to switch, they can reject this and freak out. If you move things around in there, if you have a specific environment that you have set up for them and you change it, this can cause them stress because they were comfortable in their previous home and now they don't recognize it. This doesn't mean that you can't move it around or change it from time to time, but you should be careful about needless changes that only suit your needs. And what I mean by that is, well, I'm aboard with this look. So I'm gonna change it up and put the cave here, the heat tapes over here now. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna put a thing here. They're gonna see that and they're gonna go on a lengthy hunger strike in some cases. Again, every individual is different. Some of them quite literally could care less. But in general, I'd say most of them would not appreciate this. As you go along, you might find that you need to change something that maybe you got wrong or you feel might make a positive change in their health. There's nothing wrong with this. Just realize that some changes could cause this. So I always like to say to keep it very simple when they're babies. However you want to do it, just try not to mess with it much. If you are going to, wait till they get to at least juvenile to sub-adult age. That way if they go on a hunger strike, they're going to be 100% fine. If you move things around too much when you get a new baby in, they're never going to settle in. They're never going to feel like it's home. So just try to make sure it's good the first time with at least the bare minimums, which would be hides, at least two, one for warm, one for cold, their heat tape that is regulated by a thermostat and give them their privacy and space until they're able to get enough courage or should I say confidence and more experience with you, quite frankly. Once they become more comfortable, a change in environment becomes a little bit less of a big deal, especially as they become an adult, but it is always still somewhat of a factor. Like I said, it can be as simple as the substrate change. It can be as simple as the placement of things in their environment, whether it is even a tub, which is a very simple setup, or a tank of some sort. But try to keep your changes to a minimum is I guess what I'd say. Ironically, I'm gonna throw a bit of a curveball at you. Sometimes subtle changes to the environment, changing their tub, moving them into a different enclosure, can flip the switch, and they'll start eating. For the most part, you shouldn't do this unless it's been a while. You can try it after a while, but for the most part, you should just leave them be. If it is a small snake or a hatchling, that is a good idea though. After about a month of not eating, you should do something maybe like that, changing their environment up and see what happens because sometimes that can trigger something. I've had people message me that had them in a big old open enclosure. I told them to temporarily move them into a tub and that worked. They immediately started eating. They have since now been in contact with me quite often and they've switched back to an open enclosure. Now that the snake is gaining size, they no longer have the issues they were, but as they were gaining confidence, they gained more confidence in the smaller environment. A bunch of space does not equal a bunch of happiness, especially if it's not filled up with things. They very much like their clutter. The next point is probably the most famous one, and I've already kind of alluded to it. It's that they are picky. What I mean by this is that they can and will get stuck on certain types of food sometimes. Not every snake is the same, and quite frankly, I find more often than not that you can interchange prey. In general, you do want to stick with a certain type of prey, but if you get them used to multiple things, yeah, they can switch. In fact, I've broken hunger strikes, especially for mothers that just laid their clutch. They don't want to eat right away. If I put a mouse in there, which I do not want to feed mice to my big females. I want them to eat big fatty rats because they provide more of a meal. But sometimes having something in there like a mouse triggers something in them and then they start eating again. It could be the size of the prey, quite frankly. We already spoke about the size of the prey here, but what I mean is they might prefer it a little bit smaller and especially the type of prey. This could be frozen thawed or live. There's a lot of snakes that would be more preferential to eating live. It's more natural for them. They don't eat dead things typically in the wild, although they are known to be a little advantageous and adaptable, they are normally going for wild, live prey. But whenever I sell a ball python, I'm very clear that you are usually able to switch to frozen thawed, but it's not a guarantee. You are dealing with an exotic animal here, and if you've chosen to become an owner of a ball python, and quite frankly, that means that you have chosen to feed it and care for it. So if it prefers live, you should feed it live. In my opinion, if you are not prepared to feed live, 
five rodents. I don't know or think a snake is right for you. That is my opinion, of course. Am I saying that you should always feed live? No, in fact, I think frozen thought is a great way and I recommend it for an average keeper. It's when you start to be getting to a point where you have a lot, it becomes very unmanageable. That's a topic for maybe another time, one that I have spoken about in the past, but they can develop a preference. I've also seen them develop a preference for frozen thawed. That is a bit more of a unicorn, but it is possible. So just remember that even something as subtle as their prey size, the type of prey, which could be rat, it could be mouse, it could be African softbird, affectionately called ASFs. Whatever they're stuck on though, you can try to switch them. And usually I always try to switch to rat because it is a way to get your animals to size a little bit better. But if they are stuck on it and they're not gonna switch, just feed them what they want. Our next topic, as we get to our final three, is a little more serious. This is one that you do need to worry about, but typically are able to fix and quite frankly, sometimes go away on their own, although you should never assume that. And that would be illness. Illness could be a lot of different things, respiratory infections being amongst the top of them. Anytime you're typically sick, your appetite is affected in some way, especially if you have the flu, you're not gonna wanna eat. It's not much different for ball pythons or for animals in general. When they're ill, they're not inclined to eat which can be a problem, not necessarily because they're not eating. It's more or less just because they're ill. You definitely want to address this. In some cases, you can address it with just simple changes in their environment. But ultimately, if it doesn't get better, you need to eventually make the decision to go to a reptile vet. Now, I specifically say reptile vet because there's a lot of vets out there that'll prescribe you possibly an oral or even a injected antibiotic of sorts. And sometimes that's not what they need. What you need to do is go to a reptile vet. You need to do your research and make sure that you find one within range of you because just a regular vet is just going to Google it most likely. And I'm not kidding you right now. Not all vets are equipped to look at reptiles. So make sure that there is an actual experienced reptile vet at the place you are going to. Most of the time I feel like you can actually handle it yourself, but never assume that. If your animal starts taking turns for the worse, you should definitely be prepared to go to the vet. Our next reason would be stress. Everyone feels stress, but with reptiles more than most, it can kill them. If they are not getting the privacy that they absolutely need as a requirement, if they're not getting proper husbandry, they are going to feel stress, which will lead to illness. They're very closely tied. If you take care of the essentials, then you will take care of the stress and by proxy, most likely take care of most illnesses from ever happening outside of foreign pathogens being spread in, which is a totally different topic. Reduce Reducing stress begins with you. You have to make sure that they have a regulated temperature so that they don't burn themselves or that it's too cold. If you do not provide a hot spot of between 89 to 91, they won't eat because quite frankly, they need heat to digest. They are cold blooded. So make sure they have the proper heat. Make sure that they have obviously access to water at all times. Make sure they have plenty of places to hide and make sure that you leave them alone. Of course, you wanna see them. It's a give take in terms of that, but there are certain things you still need to attend to, which is their need for privacy. You don't need to handle them all the time. And for God's sakes, don't handle them after they've eaten or even right before they've eaten. This causes a lot of stress, can cause them to regurgitate, which can lead to illness. Let them be, let them get used to their environment and realize that outside of providing them the care that they need, there's not much else in most situations that you really need to do. And the number one reason that they will not eat is because they don't want to. I know that sounds cliche, but they know when they need to eat. They will go through times that they just don't eat yearly. It is abnormal, actually, if your snake never doesn't eat. And you should count your blessings that it is doing that for whatever reason. But they naturally will go off food, especially males during breeding season. I find this to be true sometimes myself. Not every time, but there are ones that will just stop. Females almost regularly, every year will go off food. And I feel like it has something to do with their egg laying cycle, whether they're breeding or not. This is where the idea of the thousand gram wall comes from. The idea is that you get your snake up to a thousand grams, the female, and it just stops eating. It just won't get there. So you can't breed it, right? I believe this is because in the wild, these animals are producing and mating at a much smaller size than our 1500 grams that we say is the minimum. They can breed and lay eggs successfully much smaller. We just don't recommend it typically because it can cause 
cause more problems. But when they reach a certain size, they start to produce follicles. And this process right here is why I think that females stop eating. They naturally do that when they are breeding as well. They'll eat a lot. And then when they produce the follicles, they'll stop. They still go through this process. Even when you don't breed them, they just won't actually lay. Well, most of the time, believe it or not, they very rarely can lay and they can sometimes lay viable eggs through a process called parthenogenesis. So if there's no illness and there's no stress and you're positive that you've given them the proper care, just leave them be. They know when they want to eat. Don't offer it every single week. Maybe every other, maybe not even every other. Sometimes you can tell if they're interested. During feeding day, they can smell. I see the ones that are interested. They're cruising around near the top. They're very attentive when I open their enclosures. They are very quick to move towards me. Very deliberate and direct and quick in their motions and snapping their heads towards a heat source versus ones that don't. They just sit in a ball in a corner. So sometimes you can just get to know your animal and see whether it wants to eat or not. Just make sure that they're healthy. That's the biggest thing. Healthy and stress-free. As soon as you take care of these things, you shouldn't worry. Before I let you go, there is an important distinction to make here. Most of the time you don't need to worry, but in very young hatchlings, and I'm not talking about the ones you buy and take home, sometimes they don't eat for up to a month and that is fine. But if you're breeding, if you have them for a little bit longer and it's still to the point where they are not eating and now you can see a definite drop in weight, you sometimes do need to step in and do what is called an assist feed. And in an absolute worst case scenario, do a force feed. Force feed is the last ditch effort. Assist feed is much more preferable, but even then it is the second, the last thing you want to do. Cause it's an incredibly stressful experience because you're quite literally forcing food into the animal's mouth. I mean, you're just letting them eat it. Force feeding is not. You're forcing it into their mouth and then quite literally squishing it down into their stomach. I am not kidding you. It is not a pleasant experience. And most of the time you are desperate to save the snake's life at this point. Assist feeding, you put it into their mouth, you move it into it just a bit. You clamp down and you pull almost like you're setting the hook just a little teeny bit and then you put the snake down essentially maybe you hold them for a little bit so you're not as jarring to them and then you've now let the snake realize the food is fine it's good it's in their mouth they may as well eat it they go through the motion now of eating it on their own this develops well back to our other point of a habit but you should most likely not be thinking of this if you're just a pet owner or if you're brand new you should get someone who's more experienced get their advice first on it show them pictures maybe even have them come over and look at it if you know them quite well and then quite frankly they should teach you how to do it for the first time you can watch our video on how to do it as well but it should be something that hopefully you never have to do and if you do have to do it it should be the absolute last case scenario so I hope this helps you out if you wanted to see our video where we actually talked about how to help a snake with respiratory infections since this is realistically the biggest issue that you would have getting your snake to eat you can actually check out that video right here